Hello, everyone. It's good to see you all here. And we are very excited for our first uh, live session today on Zoom. Um, I'm happy to introduce to you Chris Mothersoul, who's going to do a presentation for you on performing and writing for electroacoustic clarinet. We will have some time at the end of the session for questions. So um, have those in mind. And if you think of something, please type it in the chat uh, and I will get out of the way and let Chris take it away. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jessica. And thank you also to Dr. Stephanie Gardner and the ICA New Music Committee for putting all this together because it's just such a wonderful opportunity to have this chance to sit down and share with each other some of the newer sounds that are being created by composers and performers. Um, so my name is Chris Mothersoul. I'm the instructor of clarinet over at the University of West Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. And the purpose of this webinar is kind of twofold, one of which is to get a little bit of the performer's perspective when it comes to using effects pedals with clarinet. And so this will serve as a bit of a follow up to a different presentation that a colleague of mine, Tim Fitzgerald, and I recently gave at Clarinet Fest back in July. Um, so for those that are curious to know more about this subject and have any questions afterwards, um, and haven't seen this presentation, I am uh, going to go ahead and leave a link to this presentation in the chat um, because it is still up in its entirety on the ICA's YouTube channel. Um, so the other half is to get the composer's perspective as well. So we'll have a chance to discuss things with composer Jenny Brandon. Um, now, unfortunately, she could not be here today, um, but we did go ahead and pre-record our discussion so y'all can hear some things from her in terms of the creative, creative writing process um, in regards to composing for electroacoustic clarinet. Um, so to give a brief rundown of the equipment I'll be using today, I've got a uh, piezo barrel wood model pickup installed into my clarinet to pick up the sound. And this is sent through the various effects that you'll see on my board today. Uh, and I've just picked a few simpler ones uh, that I usually recommend that performers start off with. Um, so from right to left, we've got a um, simple volume adjustment pedal. So much like the gas pedal on a car, you would ease on and off of this to fade in and out of your desired effects. This is followed up by a pitch shifter in the form of an octave pedal, followed by a delay pedal, which we'll talk a good bit about in detail today and then finally reverb. And all of this is sent out through the active PA speaker that you see behind me. And so right off the bat, we can actually go ahead and talk about reverb first because it's one of the simpler pedals that I have, um, but I find myself using it quite often actually. So you'll notice here, it's got simply just three knobs on it, each for adjusting things like the volume of the reverb itself, the length of the decay on it, and then a simple EQ adjustment as well. So going for a darker or lighter sound on the reverb. Um, and whenever I'm performing stuff with effects, I often find that I just kind of leave this one on all the time, uh, just cause it's great for adding a little bit of depth to the sound. And it comes in particularly handy, say for drier venues where you don't necessarily have that luxury of a natural reverberation. <laughs> Excuse the road noise. Um, so after that, um, I'll go ahead and talk about uh, delay a little bit. And I figured I'd focus on this one in particular um, because I would say by far it's one of the more common effects that you'll see written into solo clarinet literature. And um, it's got a similar set of knobs so that you've got on the left here, you've got a mix. So the level of the delay, delay type, uh, delay time. So essentially setting when the first echo repetition starts after you play. And then finally, what's known as feedback or the number of repeats that you can set the delay to. Um, and so to help demonstrate a couple of different uses of delay, I figured I'd explore a couple of excerpts from a different project of Jenny and I's, which involves taking an older piece of hers, Chanson de la Nature for solo clarinet and adapting it to make it work for solo clarinet and delay. Um, so if I play a little bit of the first movement without delay um, to give you all a sense of how this sounds. 
And this sounds lovely on its own. So when the um, when the theme when the when the material then gets put up the fifth and develops a little bit more, you can exaggerate and bring out this development by adding a little bit of reverb. So in this case, I've got a longer sustained one at this point to give a little bit more of an atmospheric ambient type sound um, to create a little bit of depth and texture. And so this is a common use of delay that I find really beautiful because again, it really um, heads towards that more atmospheric ambient um, type sound quality, um, which can be really cool to use with a single line instrument such as clarinet. Um, now, what I can do additionally is I can add a little bit of pitch shifting in here. So I'll add the octave below that for even added depth. And then I'll fade in and out a little bit with the volume pedal to give you all a sense of how I like to use this. Now, another different type of delay that you can use um, is going to be to set up more of a precise rhythmic interaction um, to give the illusion of two or three players rhythmically interacting with each other. So if I skip to the second movement of this piece where it's got a much more bouncy, um, light, articulated quality to it, I can get these figures to pop a little bit more by essentially setting up a quarter note length delay. So once I play, the delay will wait a quarter note to come back and bounce back. So to create a little bit more of a playful interaction, essentially kind of between your past and present self sort of scenario. So I'll set it up as a slightly shorter delay this time. And we'll try a little bit of that again. And so this, this one I personally find a lot of fun because, again, you kind of give that illusion of two or three different players bouncing back and forth in a more chamber music-like aspect. Um, so what we'll go ahead and do is perhaps look at some common uh, notation examples that I've seen in some scores um, to give you a sense of how, as a performer, you might see this written in some parts of solo literature. Um, one thing I will go ahead and say, though, is that you know notation isn't, isn't exactly standardized yet. So you'll see quite a bit of variation, as you'll see with some of these examples. Um, so this first one is a bit of an earlier example. This is um, something that you would see perhaps in Bill Smith's solo for clarinet and delay system, where as a visual learner, I love this because it's a simple graphic depiction of where each of the knobs on the pedal needs to be set to. Um, so in this instance, you've got uh, volume or mix on the left, delay time in the center, and feedback or your number of repeats on the right hand side. Um, and so as much as I love this from a visual perspective, the only thing about it is that, you know, over the decades as the guitar pedal industry has evolved and boomed, you'll find that there's a lot more variation in terms of what delay pedals look like. So uh, more or less knobs to adjust. Some of these knobs max, max out at different values. Um, so this sort of notation isn't exactly a one size fits all kind of scenario nowadays. So in this case, we'll look at something at perhaps uh, something a little more modern and more specific um, that's accessible to a wider range of performers. Um, so with example A, you've got a simple sort of effect on or off scenario. 
um, whenever it needs to be switched in the sheet music. And if there are any specific parameters within that effect that you need to set, then the composer will specify these in the instructions and the beginning of the score. Um, example B is something that I've seen in some examples, and I've started to do this in my arrangements and compositions as well, to give you a more specific sense of what needs to be set right off the bat. Um, so the moment the delay needs to be turned on, you've already got your parameters right there. So mix from zero to 100%, delay time, which is usually expressed in seconds or milliseconds, followed by your number of repeats to set the delay to. In addition, I've also included a, an example of pitch notation as well. So with a pitch shifter, oftentimes these come in the form of octave pedals one way or the other. Um, but some pitch shifters do give you the option of shifting within the individual semitones within those octaves. So that's where I find it helpful personally as a performer to have that plus or minus number of semitones. So in this case, we would have an octave down shift. Um, example C is a bit of an um, interesting variation where much like the second movement of Chanson, you've got a quarter note delay that is a little bit more specific in that instance to create that rhythmic interaction. So rather than expressing the delay in seconds, you could express the delay in terms of the rhythm within a specified tempo of a piece. So in this instance, the only difference is that instead of one second, you've just got it notated as a quarter note. Um, and then what I'm, what I'm working on currently is a larger collection of notation examples. I'm planning on, on having these up on my website very soon. Um, so for composers interested in writing for this sort of stuff, um, I'm hoping to have that resource up very soon, um, especially when it comes to notating things like volume in terms of using a volume pedal um, and chorus and other effects. Um, so now I think what we can go ahead and do is I'll go ahead and let this um, pre-recorded discussion uh, between Jenny and myself go. Because um, like I said, she wasn't able to be here today. Um, this is also going to include a sneak peek of a new composition of hers coming up um, in which you'll hear a little bit more of the delay and the reverb effects in action. Um, that being said, I don't know exactly how much time we're going to have for questions after this. Um, so that being said, if anybody does have any questions that they're dying to ask or anything that they're curious about, um, go ahead and leave them in the chat, actually, because as this discussion plays, I'm going to be monitoring the chat as we go. Um, so if any, so if anybody has anything fire away, I'd be happy to go back and forth on any of this that y'all have any questions about. So that being said, here's a little of something from the composer side of things with Jenny Brandon, uh, with a sneak peek of her upcoming composition for clarinet and delay. Hey everyone. Um, I'm here with composer Jenny Brandon whom I've had the great pleasure of collaborating with for a new composition of hers titled Cacophony for solo clarinet and delay pedal. Uh, now, Jenny, both me and my students have really enjoyed playing your works over the past few years, but before we get started, can you perhaps tell us a bit about yourself or maybe how you would describe your compositional style? Sure. And thanks for chatting with me and for this whole process and project, because it's been really fun. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so my, my, my style compositional, I, I definitely um, go towards writing a lot about nature and the natural world. Um, as, as is apparent by the, some of the stuff I think your students have played <laughs> as well. Um, I tend to really like to write um, lyrically and melodically. Um, it comes from my background um, as a singer. I find over the years um, that I've really gravitated towards writing these very melodic gestures that, um, you know, I, I often say, you know, a lot of the instruments, you know, will feel very much like a voice singing. And so I tend to, I tend to bring that into my music as well. So when we first started talking about doing a collaboration, what would you say specifically drew you into that combination mm -hmm. of the clarinet sound with live effects? Well, it, it was something I'd never done before and hadn't really been exposed to until we started talking. And it was just such a fascinating exploration of what, how you could take, you know, 
these two things, clarinet and 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 pedal here, and bring them together to create this entirely new world. And so just the opportunity to do that was just really cool and really exciting um, to try something new um, and to kind of you know dip my toe into a place that was very different for me. Um, but what I've discovered is that I love it. And it really opens up this world of creating, you know, ethereal places. And um, I like to do a lot of, you know, sound, sound painting, right? And so I think that the pedal really opens up that opportunity um, with this combination of the clarinet. Considering this is your first time writing for electroacoustic clarinet, um, what are some of the things that you perhaps remember going through your mind at first? when you started working on cacophony? Because like you said, you weren't really, um, you know, used to these sort of sounds yet. Uh, so I'd be curious to get a little bit of a sneak peek at, or a little bit more detail in terms of your thought process. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think it felt like learning a new language in that regard. Um, and because, because it was so new, you know, even even, you know, you and I worked together so much and you were so helpful in breaking down all of the opportunities and options, um, you know, from this pedal with the clarinet. And, and at first it was like, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then as you started, you know, walking me through everything and, and being so clear and, you know, playing so many examples of what was possible, I started to settle into this idea of, okay, this is really just, I mean, it's another tool in our, you know, toolbox of expression as composers. And it's another, um, we were talking a little while ago about this idea of being like almost another instrument, you know, that is a, is a duet partner with the clarinet. And so I think that that was really something exciting and it's fresh. That was the other thing too. It was such a fresh, um, way to approach writing a piece. And so it was really exciting. Like it was, you know, it's like, you know, picking up an instrument and learning it for the first time. Like as you begin to learn more and more and you get a little better at understanding how it all works, suddenly it opens up a whole new world and like new things click into place and new um, possibilities for creating colors and sound. So it was, it was a fun journey. Um, it went from a little terrified <laughs> to, <laughs> What else can we do with this? <laughs> what are some things that you found particularly fun or or challenging about the writing process? You touched on some of these things, so I guess I'll clarify a little bit too. So what would you say was perhaps a favorite sound of yours to explore in this work? Sure, sure, yeah. So um, I always love the color of tambral trills and I always love how they shimmer, like just on the instrument by itself, it just shimmers. Um, but in this piece, I wrote, there's a particular section that uses these timbral trills to kind of float above this hazy gesture, um, that's in the clarinet. And I think we're using the, um, um, digital delay, yes. um, at that point. And it's creating this sort of mist, this wall of sound, you know, as a cacophony is kind of building and the use of the timbral trills kind of starts to float above that mistiness. And so with the use of the pedal for this, wow. I mean, just the opportunity to be able to sort of create this layer and then create this other like multiple textures on a, you know, on a solo instrument was so cool. And I just, I love that it shimmers even more because of the delay on it as well. So it's just, it's such a great, I think it's just a great effect. And I was really excited to, to discover that. Before we play this preview for y'all, um, Jenny, is there anything else you would like to tell us about the piece in terms of inspiration, background, anything like that? Sure. Um, so the, the idea of cacophony, um, and, and this it's, it's a, it's a piece about, birds singing at dawn. Um, and uh, some of the inspiration for this piece came from a big tree that sits outside of and actually in front of my neighbor's house. And it's got this huge canopy. And in the spring, especially at dawn and at dusk, the birds all come to this tree and they start singing and they start singing. And then suddenly it is just a cacophony of sound. And then sometimes they'll get startled and the sound just stops. 
and then it starts right up, back up again. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun in this piece to kind of find that cacophony energy of these birds? So that's that's what this piece explores: are these um, these birds, you know, a lone bird singing at dawn, then joined by some other birds, and then a whole bunch of birds, and then finally everybody just you know goes back to that single bird song and they go about their day. So that's kind of the the basic idea of the piece, and just kind of getting to create this world using the delay pedal and using the clarinet, and it it was just um, so much fun so much fun to, to do this and, and to work with you, Chris, like it just, it's been such a delightful collaborative project. gone through this whole learning process um, in writing for this sort of combination of sounds, what kind of tips or advice would you have for composers wanting to get into this? Sure. Um, my advice is work with you <laughs> to learn about these pedals. <laughs> and that's it. No, I, 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 but I'm serious about that because you're such a great teacher um, at explaining this, you know, and you're so passionate about this, um, you know, this new world of effects. And so composers, as you're working on a piece um, for, for something like this, you know, work with your performer and really get them to dig into the nuts and bolts for you because it makes a world of difference. You know, sit down and just spend a couple hours having someone really walk you through it because that's the collaborative part of this, right? And that's the, the joy of a project like this is that we get to work one-on-one -on -one to really understand. And that's going to make the piece so good. It's going to make it so idiomatic for the instruments. I'm saying instruments because there's the pedal involved as well. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. And then try stuff, try it and see what works. Um, you know, we, we were working on the piece back and forth and we had a couple sections where 
the transitions just weren't right. You know, it was a little, little crunchier than I wanted the cacophony to be. And, you know, we went back and forth on it to, to really work that out. And so that's an important part of the process for this, especially because you need to hear it and then go back and tweak it. So work one-on-one, -on -one, get lots of examples played for you and collaborate. One of the things that was helpful for us to talk about, for example, was just in terms of notation, because, mm -hmm. you know, as we as I mentioned earlier in this talk, um, the, it's not really standardized yet. So it's just like, you know, coming up with a way for you to feel like it's the clearest for whoever's going to be playing this to be able to know, like when to switch various effects on and off, you know, what kind of settings they need to set these things to. Um, and so that's something that you can play around with for a while. And it doesn't, there's at the moment, at least there's not really a strictly right or wrong answer. It's mm -hmm. just whatever you think is going to get the message through the most clearly. And that's really helpful, you know, just for composers thinking about like, yeah, the clarity of the score, you know, go, go look at some scores now because, you know, Chris has been doing so much work, right. You've been doing all this work on these, on these scores and, you know, getting, putting scores together and arranging stuff yourself, like, look at some examples of these scores to kind of get an idea of where it might work in your score and then make it as clear as possible just like you said well with that i think um we're about good here so thank you so much jenny for joining us it was really awesome to have you here to talk about all of this stuff i i i love the fact that we're getting you know not only the performer's perspective but also the composer's perspective from this as well because like you said it really just comes down to that sort of collaborative idea mm -hmm. when it comes to an aspect of clarinet performance that still has lots to explore that being said if um if y'all are interested in performing this work, um, I will say that there there is still some room left in the co in the commissioning consortium. So feel free to reach out to me um, through mothersoulclarinet.com. If you're interested in Jenny's works in general, you can visit her website at jennybrandon.com. Um, she's got some wonderful stuff for clarinet, um, including a um, version with delay of one of her previous works, uh, Chanson de la Nature for, for solo clarinet. Um, so again, thank you so much, Jenny. It was great, thank to, you. great to have you here. Sweet. And um, something I'll go ahead and say is I got, I got a question right there at the very end um, that I wanna talk about a little bit. So just kind of first steps for self-teaching for anybody interested in, in getting this sort of stuff. I would say part of it kind of starts with either getting a pickup or a microphone as a way to capture the sound. Um, so for me, like for example, like I said, I use this um, I use this piezo barrel pickup. Um, I've seen people have really good luck with external microphones as well. Um, so just doing some research in that regard to find you know where to get started in that sense, um, and then finding a speaker to go with that. So you can either use a keyboard amp. Um, I've got a PA speaker here. Um, and then, uh, guitar amps can also work as well. Um, after that, for me, the pet, the pedals, um, part of it was really fun and just getting, getting myself down to like a local music shop, for example, um, and just asking people there, um, guitarists that already knew about pedals and all the gear involved, um, just some good effects to get started with, um, delays a first one, a great first effect to play around with, um, and there's more information on my website as well. Um, so if you want to know more, um, you can always reach out to me there. Um, and I'll go ahead and say, since you mentioned the software part of it, if, you're already, if you have something like Ableton Live and you've used that before, um, that's a, that can be a really great way to start too. Um, I've, I've seen people do some amazing things with live audio processing um, through software like Ableton. Um, so in that case, um essentially like let, like i said there's a contact form on my website so if you have any any other questions in terms of teaching yourself how to do this sort of stuff i'm happy to talk about this stuff at any time okay well <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure my my view kind of didn't go back to the way that it was supposed to be for some reason so um 
we'll just wrap it up there. Um, we do have a session starting just about um, two minutes over on YouTube that will continue more on this topic as focusing more on distortion. Um, and then we'll come back here to Zoom for Andrea's uh, presentation at two o'clock. So I'm gonna drop the, the link here um, for this YouTube session in the chat. So go ahead and click that and head on over to YouTube and we will see you there. Thank you so much, Chris. Awesome, thank you. Bye.